Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the new studio. The last videos I uploaded were taking you through the process of draping a bodice over the stays and then transferring those drapings to brown paper so that we have a good copy of the pattern, which I have in this brown envelope here. My name is Kelly Arlene Grant. I am proprietoress of Sweet Shoe Historical Clothing. And in this video, I'm going to take you through the process of gown construction. So I have everything laid out here that I will need for uh, the process of constructing a gown. This is what I'm going to make the lining out of, my pattern. The instructions, which if you send me a note, either down below in a comment um, or contacting me through email or um, Facebook, I will send these to you so that you can have them to follow along this video as well. Um, they are part of my dissertation, but I will make them widely available to anyone who requests the instructions. I'm also going to need a green board because I'm working on my ironing board. Um, I, I work on the ironing board quite a bit because it's a good height for me. Trusty glasses. Over here, just out of the camera range, I have all my sewing implements. I have my thimble, my scissors, a selection of hand sewing needles, straight pins, wax, and linen thread to do the construction. This is the fabric that we're going to be using for this gown. Uh, the print is slightly post-period in its layout, but I love this particular piece of cloth and the registration of the print. It's a hand block print. It is so cool. I, I've, I've been in love with this print for quite some time. So I'm just going to use it um, because we can. I'm going to measure it off just to see how much we have. And this is the Mark 1 eyeball method. There's six yards of cloth here, so more than enough to make a gown, possibly even make a gown in a petticoat. Um, and we will try to cut it so that um, the gown is cut the most efficiently to prevent, preserve enough cloth for an extra petticoat. I'll be using all of the things, like all of the little tiny bits of uh, scrap cabbage as well, um, so that we can make the most use of the cloth. Okay, so the pattern. There's her rough sleeve pattern. Those are her stays patterns. So I'll put those, I don't need those anymore. I'm going to put those back in the envelope. And I'm going to cut with my paper scissors the pattern out, cutting very carefully on the line.
So that's Jenny's actual sleeve pattern, and I'm going to set that aside for later because we're not going to work on that just yet. This is my sleeve template. It's my basic 18th century sleeve. So we're going to set those aside for later. Now, the important thing about this particular pattern is that we press it. If you work with a wrinkled pattern, the wrinkles are going to show up in your work. So just with a dry iron, no steam, take two seconds and press your pattern pieces flat. And the gown that we're making today is going to be a stomacher front gown with an alfro back. So the pleats are going to start at the back neck and go all the way down to the hemline. And it's all going to be pleated in the back. This is a an interesting piece of linen that made its way into my stash of fabrics. It's printed, which is odd, um, but we can use it for the lining. I likely got it fairly cheaply because it's an ugly color. And I'm going to take a moment to also press my fabric. Again, I don't want wrinkles in it because those wrinkles will show up in the fit. So I'm lining up my grain lines. You can measure across to the salvage edge, but I've been at this enough to be able to tell for this type of garment where my grain line is. And I'm going to mark my stitching line. And then cut a half an inch beyond. Now you can also use pattern weights to hold your pattern down or pin through the pattern. Whatever you need to do to make it stay in place. If I was making trousers, the green line would be really important to get absolutely perfect but for this bodice it's okay to be really close
If you're listening, you'll hear that I'm using the entire blade of my scissors. It's important to use the whole blade of your scissors so that you don't create a notch where the scissors will dull and not cut anymore. And you can also hear the cat in the background. There are lots of tools out there to help you create a good even seam allowance. Little measuring devices or even just the end of your measuring tape. Those bits of linen I would use for char cloth or um, scrap for other things, but because I have a lot of linen right now, scraps, I am not going to bother saving them. Very carefully, I'm going to flip the pieces over. and chalk my other line. If you wanted to, you could chalk each individual piece separately and cut it out. I'm just saving time by cutting two pieces at the same time. I made sure that my pieces were evenly on the grain line, both the front and the back fold before I started cutting. But if you've got fabric that you're not quite sure how it's going to react, cut each piece separately. There, those are the pieces that I'm going to need right away. Let's have a look at the instructions, shall we? So, on my instructions, I make it painfully clear that you will need stays. You're also going to need a shift, petticoats, and desired hip supports, so that when you do the draping, you know where the body is going to be and all of the supports are going to hang out. So those are important to finish before you do the draping. And you can refer back to that previous video for the draping and the pattern making. So my first instructions are to drape a cotton bodice over the dress body. Transfer the cotton draping to paper. So I've done those in the first two videos. Cut this pattern in linen, which I have done to be used as the lining of the garment. 
and I'm not using the draping as the lining. The draping, once it's done, is done. Once it's transferred to paper, you throw that out. Um, because factory cotton has a very limited usefulness with all its sizing in it. And once you wash the sizing out of it, it's really a dish rag and you don't want to be wearing it. It's not going to have the structural integrity that you need for the lining of the garment. Okay, so we're going to begin with the back. I'm going to put this piece over here. And that was the mail. So the first piece we're going to start with is the back. I'm just kind of blending in with my ironing board there. And what I'm going to do first is prep my thread. And I'm using linen thread and I'm going to run it through the wax a couple times. And then I have a, a, a rag attached to the edge of my ironing board so that I can press my thread. Trying not to tie it all in knots. And you press your thread between those two sheets of scrap linen so that the wax sets in your thread. Now I'm going to pin my two pieces together, pinning line to line. Pin at the top. Pin at the bottom. That little maneuver is called popping the middle, pin the middle, middle, Now, my line starts down here, away from the edge, but I'm going to start right at the edge of, of the cloth, or as close to the edge as possible. I'd say probably maybe a quarter of an inch away from the cut edge, and I'm going to use a small spaced back stitch. So I'm going to start with a back stitch, and then scoot a line of running stitches taking the pins out as I go. You don't want to sew over your pins, even hand sewing, because they're going to create a bubble in your seam. And then every once in a while, I'm going to make another back stitch. Now, 
You could also sew this seam by machine. If you do, set your machine to like a three stitch length. Back stitch at the beginning and the, and the end and stitch the whole seam past the line. But this is pretty quick to do by hand too. So my stitch length is about three millimeters or a fat sixteenth, a skinny eighth. Not tiny at, a, at any means um, too tiny and the stitches are going to just perforate the fabric after a while and there's no need of it really as long as your stitches are as small as you can comfortably make them quickly and are nice and even that's all that matters and I'm going down past the line on the bottom as well and I'm going to finish off this seam with some back stitches and then a knot And like I said, you can s totally do this seam by machine. Honestly, if they're looking at the inside of your gown, they should be buying the dinner first. Or at least asking your consent. <laughs> and I'm going to run a tail off of my thread. I'm not going to clip it right at the knot. And running it, you'll see that I run a tail a lot in my sewing. And that's just to keep it so that the knot doesn't undo itself because there's no thread to hold it. After a seam, I'm going to press the seam. And what does the instruction say to do next? I'm going to prep this for finish, which means I'm going to fold up the hem. And you could even base this in place, which is what I might do. And I'm making a nice mitered corner there at the bottom.
steam is hot. And I should have just enough thread there. to hold that hem in place. And I'm just using a basting thread, basting stitch, so it's a good quarter inch long. And I'm doing this so that when we start pleating the back, The hem is already in place, so I don't have to worry about unstitching things to turn the hem up. Yeah, just enough. And I'm going to finish off the seam with a couple of back stitches. I'm not even going to worry about knotting it. I am going to leave a tail. Okay, so there is my back ready to pleat. I should put my green board down so that I'm not stitching through to the ironing board because having a gown stitched to the ironing board would be not helpful. Okay. So there is my lining all ready to go. Now, the in next instruction says to cut the first length of fashion fabric the measurement of the nape to the floor with the desi desired hem. Luckily we want to make this gown a bit shorter. I'm thinking probably knee length, maybe a little longer. And since Jenny is a tall woman I'm just going to cut off a bit of a, oh, I should make a cut and cut off all of this extra rough edge. And then saving these, because these will come in handy later. And then we're going to go for two and a half yards. That should be more than enough. So I'm going to mark the middle.
then I'm going to line up the middle of the fabric with my seam. And if this center back seam is curved on your pattern, then the center back of your gown is going to have a curved seam as well. And it says to mark the neck edge, the shoulder seam, and the side seam. So what I'm going to do, line it up. I'm, I'm overhanging a bit on the top there, just so that I have a bit extra to play with and here's where I'm going to use a lot of straight pins. I'm going to pin the bottom layer to the bodice in a couple of spots. Open it up. And I can feel the point of the bodice down here at the bottom. I can even feel, feel the seam through the mark. So, I'm going to begin my pleating of the back. So I've marked the top and the bottom. I think I want to get that pin perpendicular because I'm going to want to pleat on it. Okay, and now we start pleating. And here's where you're going to want to have an image of an 18th century gown pattern to follow along with. So I have dug out my trusty Janet Arnold book that I have used for 30 years now. And I'm very excited to know that they're going to be reprinting it this year in color, which is kind of exciting. Um, but there is the Polonaise gown in here that I want to use. And I want that pleating diagram. So it tells me that I am going to pick up a pleat and go to the center with it. And it's not a big one. And I'm careful to make sure that my lining is not also pleated. And I'm going to make sure that I'm doing the same on both sides. As close to the same as possible.
I mean, this is a draped garment after all. And then the next pleat we're looking at, the next two pleats are going to go out from the center. And I want to start making them into a bit of a, a V. And and yeah, you're going to need to pleat both of them at the same time without pinning them down. Because if you pin the top one, then you won't have room for the second one to tuck underneath. And yeah, I make this look easy, only because I've done it a bazillion times. Take your time with this step. And if need be, pleat it and walk away from it. And just let it hang out on your ironing board or on your work table. Go make a cup of tea. Go have lunch. And then come back to it and see if you still like it. Just making sure that I haven't pleated everything underneath as well. Okay. I'm making sure everything is nice and flat underneath there, that I don't have any extra watches of fabric. Like that one right there.
So now would be a good time to go make yourself a cup of tea and take a quick break. Okay, this is me back after I've had a pee and a glass of water and I'm good to go and I still like this bleeding arrangement. I'm happy with that. Double checking. One, two, three. Just the three pleats. Okay. Very carefully, I'm going to flip it all over. And this is the scary part, folks. I'm going to trim away my excess. Now, I'm not going all the way down to this point. I'm stopping about, oh, a good inch and a half away. And I'm not cutting straight across here. I'm cutting at a bit of an angle so I have extra fabric. Okay, flip it back over. And I have a whole lot of material down there for a go. Probably did not need the whole two and a half. When in doubt, measure your client. But my client's not here at the moment. So I measured long. So I'm going to pat everything back into place there nicely. I'm going to scoop my work board over a little bit. because I'm going to get back to pressing my thread. Need my thimble, my wax, my thread, my sewing needle, because now I'm going to stitch down pleats. So now I am feeling the hem because I don't want to start stitching below the hem. I'm going to go up underneath that first pleat to hide my knot. And here's where I'm going to stitch about an eighth of an inch in from that folded edge of the pleat with a running back stitch. So the back stitch is going to be moving along with a space in between, but it's going to be a back stitch all the way up, tacking the pleat to the lining underneath, which is why I need this green board, because I use it to feel when I've gone through all of the little layers and can come back up again. And you want to take your time with this step and make your stitches nice and even and evenly spaced and beautiful. Because this is one of the seams that people are going to see. Yeah, 
if you were making this as a costume or if you were making this for theater and you needed to bang out a dress in an hour, you could top stitch all of these pleats down by machine. But since we're doing this for living history, I'm going to take the time to hand sew. This is one of the steps that I'm going to really take my time with. Okay, so that took me a couple hours of gentle sewing. All my pleats are stitched down now and look lovely. And I made sure that they were even on both sides so that they went to a nice point at the back. Last thing I'm gonna do is flip it over and baste my side seam on this side. I did that on that first side once the first uh, half of the sewing was finished and that's to keep everything in place so it's not all flopping around and being an octopus because who needs an octopus messing with your sewing And I'm just doing the basting stitch in the seam allowance. And that's just to hold the two layers in place. Just noticed I didn't backstitch on that first round of basting. So before I trim the thread, I'm just going to bait the backstitch there to secure it. Now, the scary part of gown construction. And I think I want to do it from this side so I can see what's going on. Okay, so everything is pleated and basted and secure. Now what I want to do is, OK, 
continue on this release cut and I'm going right to the hemmed edge of the bottom of the bodice and I want to be careful when I do my cut not to cut into my pleats so make sure where you be sure where your pleats are but what I'm going to do and this is very scary <laughs> I'm going to follow that hemmed edge and cut into the bodice. Can you see what I'm doing? I'm cutting along that hemmed edge right there to about in line with my first row of stitching. But Kelly, why are you doing this? Because there are pleats that need to be done. And yes, this is scary. Just be very careful. And mindful of where your stitches are. Okay, done cutting. <laughs> Let's flip it back over to the right side again. Can you see there? I've cut. And we're back to pleating again. Okay, so what I want you to do is fold up that bodice edge ever so slightly, and it's going to be like a, an arrow point almost. And I'm going to need to get rid of my green board because I'm going to need to press it in place. Green board is gone. Okay. So, you're going to fold up that cut edge of your bodice ever so slightly, ever so slightly, like, eighth of an inch maybe. Just enough to be able to stitch it down. and press that fold into place. And then do it on the other side. Okay, now what we're going to do is pleat in the pleats to the side back. And we're not going to pleat in a whole lot because um, I don't want the pocket openings way back here where the side seams are of the bodice. I want the pocket openings to be in line where it's comfortable to put your hands in your pockets. Um, so I won't be pleating all the way to this edge. Probably two thirds of it. Okay? And Going back to my line drawing from Janet Arnold, the pleats are going outwards. So I'm just knife pleating.
but I think that'll be enough. And I'm going to make sure that the pleats are tucked up in the bodice enough so that the over bodice can cover that raw edge. I'm pre preparing my thread again. This is where it's going to get fussy. So what you're going to have to do is hold the lining out of the way. The lining is just going to hang out there and do this. Because what you're going to do now is come up under that folded bodice edge with your knot. And you're going to stitch the folded bodice to the tops of your pleats and yeah it's going to make a bit more of a fold don't worry about that it'll all come out in the wash you just want to enclose that raw edge and with a felling stitch or a slip stitch Stitch the folded edge of your bodice to your skirt through all of the layers if you can. <laughs> Using really tiny stitches. And I've just run my knotted my thread and run it up in between the two layers there. Now, what's going on on the inside? This is what's going on on the inside. This is just going to hang out inside the skirt, all of this extra pleating material. It just hangs out there and just, you know, you forget that it exists. And don't worry about it fraying or anything like that because... This gown's not going to ever go in the washing machine. <laughs> it's certainly not going into going in the dryer. Um, and we'll deal with this bodice later. Um, but yeah, just leave those pleats behind. And that's a nice little bit of finish work. So I'm going to do the other side and then call it a day. Because it's been a lot of sewing this afternoon. And uh, yeah, we can call it a day. It'd be really hard to pin this fold in place. Uh, you kind of just have to hold it in place with your fingers and then stitch along. Bear's having a great snore underneath the cutting table.
So that little slip stitch right here along that folded edge, you also see a running back stitch along that edge or a spaced black back stitch. Um, this little slip stitch might be a little bit of over engineering on my part, but it holds that little tiny hem in place really securely so that you don't have a raw edge flipping out and causing you to look like a bad dressmaker at this point. So there is the back of this gown. And that's kind of what it should look like at this point. It's got some pleats in the back. The side seams of the skirt are there to be pleated into the front bodice when I start that in the morning. Um, but that's a good enough work, amount of work for today. Um, any more than this and I would start to get a little cranky and not make good seams. So I'm going to stop for the day and go do something else like laundry or sit in front of the computer. Anyway, it was uh, great spending the day with you and uh, come back tomorrow for the next step.